At the very bottom of Azure, what we're doing is making sure that we're a great platform for, for containerized workloads. This is truly where we see the, the world going is with everything moving into containers. Of course, that doesn't mean virtual machines are gonna go away overnight. They're gonna be here for many, many years and even decades to come. But we wanna make sure that we support containers and the high density, very efficient, very high performance deployment and management of containers at massive scale very well. So we've been working on an infrastructure to support containers called Atlas that underlies all of our container offerings. Atlas is built on top of Azure Service Fabric and it runs on top of virtual machine scale sets and orchestrates the placement of containers inside of virtual machines and maps up through its APIs onto other application models that map down to it. So some of the first ones that you see, the first workload that we brought onto Atlas is Azure Functions for Linux. When you deploy an Azure Function for Linux in the consumption plan, that is actually going into an Atlas container. And right now, we've been migrating Azure Container Instances onto Atlas as well. So when you deploy Azure Container Instances either for Linux or Windows, those are moving and being deployed and managed on top of Atlas clusters. But every single type of application that supports containerized workloads, those models will underneath map down and leverage atlases through the Atlas control plane deploying under these service fabric clusters. But we don't wanna just deploy containers into virtual machines. We wanna leverage native performance. And so we're also at this very point in time migrating Atlas onto what we call our bare metal infrastructure. Bare metal infrastructure in Azure is managed through a service called Pilotfish. Pilotfish is responsible for deploying the base server infrastructures and the software that brings and bootstraps those services, which then will bootstrap virtual machine layer on top of it. But we can target through a unified fabric with that's all running Pilotfish, either servers on bare metal and deploy containers as first class citizens side by side with virtual machines on the same servers, or even containers that take up the whole server because they're large containers. And so that is also something we're working on is fulfilling this vision of having Atlas be a unified data plane for both containers and it's sitting side by side with our virtual machine infrastructure and all being managed through a common allocator. So that's a look at the, the compute infrastructure, but we're also working on innovations when it comes to compute infrastructure. And one of them is leveraging accelerators. I talked in part one about GPUs and that's a type of accelerator. We, uh, we've got general purpose compute and CPUs, of course, but accelerators are really great at doing one thing really well. They're ASICs designed for special type like matrix multiplication and addition for deep learning that, and doing that one task extremely well, extremely efficient, extremely low cost and low energy. But many types of applications and algorithms don't map so neatly into ASICs. So we've been investing in FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays. I talked about them earlier in the context of Azure networking, where we offload our networking stack and program that in FPGAs. But the challenge that we've had is despite the fact that FPGAs can accelerate workloads and kind of have the, the programmability closer to more CPUs than GPUs or, or ASICs, is that they're extremely hard to program up to now. So that has made the, the system, because uh, up to now, the only way to really program them is, is using Verilog or System Verilog or very low level kind of languages that map down to the kind of gates, the low level silicon gates that you need to program dynamically. And that's made them inaccessible to general purpose programmers. It's also made it very hard and very time consuming to make efficient FPGA programs or roles. So we've been investing in a new language a new language that will make it easy to develop accelerated hardware workloads. This new language plus a tool chain with Visual Studio Code extensions, Azure Marketplace images for it, and we've already been using this internally in Azure Quantum and Azure Networking, and we've got POCs ongoing with Azure Synapse, Azure Storage, Microsoft Edge, and we've also have engaged in some with some third-party customers. I wanna talk a little bit about each of these usages, because one is in accelerated networking, we're able to take the hand-coded uh, Verilog that we developed as part of that accelerated networking stack, implemented in this new language for FPGAs, 
and get 40% better packet processing throughput over the hand-coded RTL. So this is not something that really surprised us is not only can it make it very, uh, to improve the time to solution by orders of magnitude, weeks instead of months, but actually we can do better than the handcrafted solution. The same thing with Azure Storage Protocol Engine. Handcrafted versus uh, RTL baseline, uh, sorry, versus the, the language generated code, 6% lower logic utilization, so meaning we can pack more into the same FPGA, 30% lower memory utilization, and 140% throughput improvement. The same kinds of improvements on Azure Synapse and quantum inspired optimizations, which I'll show you in this demo right here. So in this demo, what you're gonna see here is a quantum inspired algorithm that's gonna solve the three sat problem or the, the three term Boolean satisfaction problem. We've been able to develop an algorithm to solve that problem based off of quantum behaviors. So that's why we call it quantum inspired optimization. We implement this in the Q -sharp SDK with this new language and tool chain, produce an acceleration for this QIO based algorithm and then run it on the NP Xilinx virtual machine type, which are FPGAs. So here's the handcrafted RTL in uh, uh, VHDL that you can see right here. It looks nothing like the traditional languages that you might be familiar with. Low level definitions of every single aspect of this code, like signals and types that we're defining and arrays in a special syntax. And then you can see next to it, this new language, which we still haven't named yet, by the way. But you can see the new language here looks a lot more like standard C. You can see the if statements, the float definitions, the else's, uh, it's much more terse and much more readable and much more familiar to somebody that's coming from a C or C++ background. And then you can see here's what is generated from the new language compiler, which gets down into this RTL that goes into the FPGA role. And you can see just how verbose that is. So you definitely don't wanna be implementing in that. Now what I'm gonna do is run each of these, the quantum inspired algorithm using the C a CPU, using an FPGA, and using the VHDL version, also on an FPGA, and compare them side by side. So I'm kicking off the run here of the VHDL. You can see that I had 812 seconds on the CPU, so I sped this up a little bit. 5.487 seconds from the handcrafted VHDL. And then with our new language compiler, we get a run that's 3.7 seconds. So roughly 40% less time than it took to find the solution using the handcrafted VHDL, which is much more cumbersome. So it really shows that the kind of the beginning of a new era for accelerated offload of different workloads accessible to a vastly greater audience of developers than what we had before. We think this is gonna be very transformative. So another area where we've been innovating is in the area of confidential computing, a term that we helped coin. I actually started working on confidential computing back in 2014, Microsoft Research even earlier than that, and really realized that confidential computing could be a game changer for the public cloud, even back then. So we started the effort collaborating closely with Microsoft Research, working with our hardware partners like Intel and others on bringing confidential computing technologies into Azure in the form of Intel SGX in that example. Also working on research into tooling and runtimes to support moving and building applications on top of confidential computing hardware like SGX enclaves. So if you take a look at what an enclave is, it's a small protected region of the hardware that is inaccessible from anything outside and can't be controlled from anything outside. In the case of XGS enclaves, you reserve a small amount of encrypted memory. It's protected from physical access of the server. The memory contents never leave the CPU core on an un unencrypted form. 
And once you put something into that enclave, you can get what's called an attestation, which is a measurement of the code, establish trust in it, release secrets to it, secrets that allow it to decrypt encrypted data that only that enclave you're allowing to see. And then as that code is being processed with its machine learning algorithm, an analytics workload, a transaction query processing workload, you can be assured that nothing outside gets access to it, whether it's the admin on the server, somebody in the physical data center, a Azure operator that's touching that hardware for DevOps, diagnostics or troubleshooting, or any other software like the hypervisor that is sitting on that server. All in excess cannot access that data because it's being protected by that enclave. Now we've been working on a number of services to support this. I mentioned the Open Enclave SDK as the runtime to support migrating applications onto Enclave technology, whether it's Linux or Windows Enclaves and code. It, we're also have, are releasing a Microsoft attestation service, which allows you to get an attestation from an Enclave and process it in a convenient form, and then know that you can release secrets to the Enclave as well as something called Managed HSM, something else we're announcing here at Ignite, which is built on top of SGX enclaves where the HSMs are fronted with SGX enclaves that implement policies uh, for Azure Key Vault in kind of a single tenant form with the use of enclave isolation technology and a multi-tenant infrastructure underneath. And we're the first public cloud actually to release SGX enclaves through our DC V2 virtual machines that we announced in, uh, just a few months ago, working closely with Intel to be the first public cloud provider to provide these servers in a public cloud with virtual machine types on top of them. But where we're going with this is even further. We uh, mentioned always, uh, SQL. We've got SQL always encrypted virtual uh, version next where you're gonna have the SQL query processing engine inside the enclave but we're working on other services as well. One of them that we're announcing is Microsoft Azure Confidential Ledger. Now, what is a confidential ledger? Well, you're, you might be familiar with blockchain technology. Blockchain technology where each block cryptographically references the previous block and is signed such that you, if you tamper with a block in the chain, the cryptographic verifications fail and you know that, that the transactions that are stored in that block, somebody's tampered with them, modified them or deleted them. Where does that become useful in enterprise scenarios? Well, decentralized con consortiums through our confidential computing framework is one way, but also another way is auditing, where you want a tamper-proof audit log, where you can store auditing of certain transactions or certain operations inside of the ledger and know that they've not been tampered with and then also replicate them across different nodes so that even if one node tampers with it, you can see that from other nodes. Even if one node deletes it, other nodes have it. Even third parties can participate in that de uh, decentralized copies of those trust of those tamper proof audit logs. So lots of different scenarios from auditing high value transactions and financial scenarios to security operations in other scenarios. It becomes a general purpose service which you can leverage for these different kinds of scenarios. And a Merkle tree architecture ensures that ledger receipts are universally verifiable, meaning once you put a transaction inside of the ledger, you can get a receipt back and then later go verify that nothing's been tampered with by leveraging that receipt against a verification of that, that uh, ledger. So I wanna show you a quick demo of confidential ledger in actions, including its ability to process transactions at very high rate, as well as to verify the integrity of the ledger. So here you can see the Swagger endpoint on the confidential ledger service, which shows you that you can create confidential ledgers on top of this as Azure Resource Manager resources. And what I'm gonna do is go ahead and create a new ledger here. And one of the things that happens when we create a ledger is we specify which keys through which users as represented by their cryptographic keys are allowed to submit transactions to the ledger. And when we create the ledger, we get back a network key that is used by the confidential ledger service to allow us to verify that the ledger has actually been created by the confidential ledger service when we talk to it. So as a user, we can go verify it is an authentic confidential ledger service ledger and then submit transactions to it using our key. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. 
is we're going to submit uh, first uh, after deploying, verify that this ledger has been created. Here's the network key. It's got three nodes attached to it. So it's replicating across three nodes for durability. And then we're going to fire off the script, which sends a whole lot of transactions into it. In fact, in this initial version, we can process 5,000 transactions per second on the ledger with dozens of member nodes. And we're planning on getting up into the hundreds of thousands per second as we go forward, because this is built on confidential consortium framework technology. Now here you can see that a bunch, after a bunch of transactions are submitted, when we get a, a submitted transaction, it ends up in the pending state. When it gets committed, we get back our receipt, which is that Merkle tree ha signed hash that we can then turn around and use to verify the ledger. So here I'm gonna run a script that processes against the downloaded version of that ledger and the blocks in that ledger. And we can see that the verification succeeded because the ledger was downloaded, there was no tampering. But if I open up a hex editor and modify just a random byte somewhere in one of those blocks and run that verification again, that tampering is immediately visible. Similarly, if I delete one of the blocks and run the verification again, the verification reports that the block is missing and I can see that the, somebody's tampered with the ledger, maybe go to another node and get a full copy to has the missing transactions that might be have been deleted inadvertently or even maliciously. So this confidential ledger technology, again, general purpose technology to support a wide variety of scenarios and provide this extreme level of tamper-proof auditing and verification.